Okay, so we're going to look at electrochemical cells, and we're going to split it into the two main groups. The first one is where we have non-spontaneous redox reactions, and we see that we are working with electrolytic cells. We're going to focus on electrolytic cells now, but just so you know, for spontaneous redox reactions, we have what we call galvanic or voltaic cells. That's not going to be our focus right now. So for these electrolytic cells, what we see is that we are taking substances that will not react spontaneously, and we add electrical energy. So the number one characteristic for our electrolytic cells is that we have a direct current power source attached to our electrodes. Our electrodes are normally, not always, but normally made from graphite or carbon, and then we see that in one beaker, we will have an ionic solution of some sort. And this ionic solution can be in two forms. The first form is that we can have an ionic compound. And remember, it's not an ionic molecule. Molecules only form when we have covalent bonds. An ionic compound that is melted. If an ionic compound is melted, for example, let's take lead bromide, it's going to form PB2+, plus, and then the state will be liquid, not aqua. Aqua is only when something is in solution with water. When an ion is surrounded by water, then it's AQ. So we will have PB2+, plus, and we will have Br-, minus, but we have 2, and this will also be liquid. So when it's in a liquid state, we know that it's able to conduct a current, and therefore it can go through the process of electrolysis. The second type of ionic compound that can go through electrolysis is when an ionic compound is now surrounded by water. So when we have H2O around ions, for example, let's take NaCl. If NaCl is aqueous, it means that we have Na plus surrounded by water and we have Cl minus surrounded by water. Now also remember that ionic compounds actually form due to electrostatic forces, also known as Coulombic forces, which basically means an ion has a positive charge or a negative charge, and anions are, and cations are attracted to each other, and that's really what an ionic compound is. So when we have an ionic compound like this, and we add that solution to this beaker, we will see certain things happen. So the example I'm going to use is copper chloride. When we have copper chloride, we know that it has Cu2 plus ions and two Cl minus ions in the solution. Now also remember that our two electrodes are called the anode and the cathode. The anode is where oxidation occurs. An easy way to remember that is that both oxidation and anode start with vowels. At the cathode, we know that reduction will occur. Both of them start with a consonant. So keep that in mind. Because at the anode, oxidation occurs, we know that the anode will be positive. Remember oxidation, the release of electrons? When you release electrons, you become positive. At the cathode, reduction occurs, which means the absorption of electrons or the gain of electrons, which means that the cathode is negative. Now, if we go and we look at our table of standard reduction potentials, and we go and we find Cu2+, plus, and we go and find 2Cl-, minus, we will see that 2Cl- minus becomes Cl2 plus 2 electrons, and we see that the cell potential there is plus 1,36 volts. This is now from table 4a. And if we look at Cu2+, plus, it is going to absorb two electrons to form Cu, and the value here is plus 0,34 volts. So this helps me to identify that this is a non-spontaneous redox reaction because I see that I do not, not have a strong reducing agent or strong oxidizing agent. Only then will a spontaneous redox reaction occur. So if I look at the chlorine, 
I see that the chlorine wants to go through the process of reduction. Cl wants to gain an electron. And I know that copper wants to release an electron. So for both of these, this reaction is non-spontaneous. And therefore, we have to add the electrical energy to provide enough energy for the chemical reaction to occur. So when we have our Cu2+, plus, because it has a positive charge, the Cu2+, plus in solution, will be attracted to the cathode that is negative. We also know that the Cl-, minus, we have two of them, will be attracted to the anode because it is positive. So what will happen to the Cl- minus ions or chloride is that both of them will release their electrons. And we see that Cl2 gas will form, which means that at the anode, we will see little bubbles of gas surfacing. Chlorine gas will be released. Then we will also see that the Cu2 plus will go to the cathode and go through reduction. Where do the electrons come from? The electrons that were given off at the anode now travel to the cathode. And we see that the Cu2 plus will absorb two electrons and a copper residue will form around this electrode, which is the cathode. And here we see the formation of new products, which means that a chemical reaction has occurred. Chlorine gas is formed and copper, the metal, that residue will form. It has a reddish brown color. So this is an example of an electrochemical cell. According to your exam guidelines, there are many different applications of this process that you need to know. The first important one that we um, are quickly going to look at in terms of application is electroplating. Electroplating is where your anode is made of a certain metal, let's say, for example, silver. And then you have a solution in a beaker that will also contain silver ions, something like silver nitrate, where we know that silver nitrate, the nitrate will always dissolve and the Ag plus is available. We see that at the anode, the Ag will release electrons. And then instead of having a cathode, normally we have a spoon here that we want to plate with a certain metal. The Ag plus will gain electrons at the cathode or the spoon and it will form a residue on the spoon, plating the spoon with silver. It's not a silver spoon, it's a silver plated spoon. So this um, also is applied in using a zinc plate to cover an iron core and also tin food. We cover an iron tin with tin to prevent food poisoning and also food from reacting with the iron. So the second process that we're looking at is where we have the formation of H2, Cl2, and NaOH in the chloralkali industry. What happens here is we take brine, which is actually just very saturated NaCl, and we pump it into a container that has a cation exchange membrane. So we have NaCl aqueous as well as H2O in this container. And now we see, because NaCl is made of Na plus and Cl minus, the Na plus will go across the cation exchange membrane and it will go to the cathode. It will compete there with hydrogen to go through the process of reduction. The hydrogen, of course, comes from the water. And we see that the hydrogen will be the one that is going to be reduced, which leads to the formation of hydrogen gas. At the anode, the Cl- is going to release its electrons, becoming Cl2 gas, and that's where the formation of Cl2 comes from. And then we see that the two remaining ions in solution, the sodium and the hydroxide from water, combine to form sodium hydroxide. The chloralkali industry. Also, just I'm going to touch on the electrorefining of copper. The electrorefining of copper is where copper is actually the anode and at the cathode, and where we see that this process is used for copper to just go through this. Uh, process of electrolysis to become more refined. And then the last one, important for South Africa, is the extraction of aluminium. So aluminium, we know that aluminium is a metal. It wants to go through oxidation, which means it wants to become Al3+. Plus. But to make the opposite happen, to make aluminium oxide, aluminium oxide consists of Al3 plus ions, become Al 
we of course need to add a lot of energy in the form of electrical energy to make that happen so that we can form aluminium. Remember, aluminium oxide is also known as bauxite. 